Um, I want to thank the uh, CESA's team for inviting me here today, although I need uh, no, uh, uh, no extra incentives to come to this beautiful city of Oslo. It's true, uh, this is only my second time in Oslo, but I've, apparently this will be the only day of summer I ever experience, so I'm very happy here. I'm also happy to be here uh, in this house of literature, this, this house of learning, because while we're here to sort of exchange ideas uh, about data, I'm here to tell you about how dumb I am about data and maybe a bit about my industry, which needs to learn more about it. And if, if you hear me say data and not data, it's because I'm Canadian and it's, it's our strange pronunciation of everything. It's in learning you know, that we, we, we master our future. It's in learning that we, we, we come to get the knowledge to, to face the challenges that we have. And my comments today are uh, really focused at my publishing colleagues, um, as opposed to those of you who are already very good at data. And I want to, uh, everyone to understand that while some of this may sound a bit negative, I'm enormously positive about our, about our future. And so with that, with that said, I would uh, talk to you a bit about the, my publisher perspective, which is what CSENS has asked me to do. This is mine. Um, as mentioned, I, I run a company called Digital First Media, and Lauren gave you the details, and I sit on the boards of these companies. El País is the leading brand online for Spanish language quality news in the world, and The Guardian, the same thing in English. And it gives me a bit of a view shed into what's four and a half billion dollars of uh, publisher revenue in 24 countries. It's not the biggest one you can have, that would be something like Facebook, Google, or, or other companies. But it does give me a chance to work with teams and very talented executives who are trying to figure out what that next thing is that we have, that we have to do. And it's across multiple platforms. It's not just publishing in newspapers or in magazines. It's in television and broadcast radio as well. So this is kind of what we know. Legacy, all the old business, is shrinking. And it's not going to come back. And that seems like a very obvious thing to say. But I work in an industry that is, doesn't yet fully accept that fact and is closed in many ways to the change that they need to make. And if you don't believe me, just ask anybody in the data business or anybody in a digital services business how hard it is to sell these solutions to legacy companies who have trouble understanding what they need to do. And it's also true, of course, that we know that digital is growing, but digital is growing in total, but it's now actually slowing down in many areas. So we know mobile is growing fast, but laptop, almost not at all, in, if you have a developed laptop site, in uh, both audience and in revenue. And audiences are rapidly fragmenting many platforms, many devices. And all of this is giving us a crunch that we haven't had before, where we need to develop the new things, and now there's many more of them, and legacy media is in a crunch for profit. And so we're constantly trying to find ways to take revenue, get new revenue by taking expenses out of one end and putting it into others. And we have to build these new products all the time. And that new, new skills are needed, new people are needed, and new partnerships are needed. This is the killer crunch that we face. And of course, all things are now fill in the blank and mobile. It's social and mobile. It's video and mobile, it's content and mobile, it's ad formats and mobile. All of it has to be learned, all of it has to be built or partnered with or both. And then mobile is this magnet that uh, it's like this black hole in the universe that's sucking all revenue and all audience into it. And it's a thing that we say that we need to get and we're very slow to get there from a publishing perspective. And then we have new customers, or new, rather, competitors, what I meant to say, that we didn't have before. And so we're rapidly going to mobile, and we have these two guys who have 70% of the mobile ad market. So not only are there new customers, there are killers in that customer, meaning, meaning, meaning uh, category killers, that we have to come up against. And we'll talk a little bit about, I'll talk about this a little bit in a moment, but they're both friend and foe, depending on how you deal with them. 
and you're going to have to deal with them in both areas at the same time, and that becomes a new skill as well. Our new opportunities really are bigger than they ever been before, but so are the competitors. And then key to all of this and why all of us are here today is about data. Our two biggest competitors in my field, and particularly as we go to mobile, are building huge walled gardens of first-party data. And we're helping them do that. We're helping almost anybody we work with in building out, their, uh, building out the amount of data that they have. But to date, in my industry, and certainly even in my company, we're not very good yet about understanding our own first-party data and what to do with it. So here's what we also know. Our customer knowledge at this stage in a company like mine, which is pretty representative of a lot of American newspaper companies and certainly other newspaper companies around the world, is our customer data is, <clears throat> right now, relative, our knowledge is relatively zero. Our business, legacy business processes and methodologies, selling a newspaper on the street, listening to radio, watching television over air, um, have not given us the kind of data that we're going to need to function in the future. Our customers, to many, in many ways, are largely anonymous uh, to us. If, we, if they're a subscriber, we know who they are, we know how they pay, we know where they live maybe, and not a whole lot more. And yet, the vast majority of our customers now are online, and our knowledge of them to build a business, our knowledge about them to build our future, is relatively low. And in this new ecosystem that's been developed, this demands knowledge to function. Without that knowledge, you're flying blind. And there almost is no way to build a sustainable future without it. We know this too. <laughs> it doesn't have to be this way. There are solutions to this. So there are ever more solutions every day. There are many companies and many partners who can offer us the kind of solutions that we need. But you know, it does take a commitment to change, and it does take a commitment to learn new things, and a commitment to meet those challenges head on. Uh, my industry, I think, is still too focused on the effect of this new ecosystem on the old, and not focused enough on the fix. If you work in newspapers, and some of you have met here today too, you will find any number of stories about people who got laid off in one part of your company, and very few stories about how you used those savings to invest in whole new capabilities, whether it's with a partner, whether it's with new people on staff, that sort of thing. And it creates a sort of an environment that, seem, that is negative when some very many positive things are being done. It's part of my job, I think, going forward is to try to focus people on that positive and not on that negative. I would think, in my opinion, off-platform development, meaning where your customers are now, is the single largest, biggest challenge to us, considering if you follow my logic, at least on my company, we don't know a lot about our customers. The vast majority of our customers are online using digital, digital products. And so this is a phenomenon that I face all the time when people tell me where our content is going to run. And I now believe if I know that on any given day, it's already too late to maximize the dollars that we're going to make. And so stick with me on this for a bit. I mean, it's, you, if you only know where your product starts and you think you know where it ends, then you're maximizing for that. But you need to be maximizing for where your product goes everywhere. And you don't know that now. In the new ecosystem that we have with various platforms and various forms of media like social media and social sharing, you have no idea actually where your customers are going to go. On any given day now, if we have a very hot video and we produce 100,000 videos a year at my company, it's the vast majority of that traffic that we're so excited about happened on someone else's platform. Generally, Facebook, to, to, be, to be frank, and then followed up by Twitter. So if I'm going to maximize every penny that I need to make, and we are going from digital dollars to digital dimes and laptop and maybe digital pennies and mobile, I need to stack as many pennies into dimes, as many dimes into dollars as I can. And we're an industry that's been built on control. 
we've always known what we're going to do. We're going to publish it in the paper. We're going to produce 500,000 papers at one particular paper. We're going to sell 95% of them. We're going to pulp the other 5%. We're going to charge a mixture of home delivery rates and single copy rates for that 500,000. And we know how many pages of advertising at an average rate. We've always been highly controlled, and that doesn't exist anymore in this new ecosystem. So I do think it's the biggest issue facing successful publishers today. And I say successful because if you have this issue, you're really good at, put, at creating content to be shareable. You're already pretty good at creating content on other platforms other than your traditional platform. But it does take a, recognize, recognize it, <clears throat> a recognition rather that the majority of publishers' content today is consumed on other people's platforms. And that is going to continue. It's actually going to accelerate and we should be lucky if it does. We just have to figure out what we're going to do about that. Because we come to this last point, which is the killer point for me. Those platforms have more data about my customers than I do. When I work with Facebook and when I work with Google, and we have divisions in Silicon Valley, and we do work with both those companies, we end up knowing that they have more knowledge about our customers than we do. I don't know how to plan. I don't know how to allocate resources as a CEO when some, my competitor, also my colleague, has more knowledge about me and my customers than I do. I mean, all I do as a CEO all day is sit in my office like this. No, yes, no, yes, no, get out, don't come back, yes, no, <laughs> yes, no, come back tomorrow with a better idea, yes, no. I can't allocate resources. I can't do it unless I know what my customers are doing. And I don't have that knowledge to date. But I would say also, bigger than monetization are transparency and control of your data. I work in journalism. I say content, but my content is almost strictly journalism. And in a post-Snowden world, in a post-Snowden slash NSA world, transparency is absolutely key. My customers need to trust me, and I need to work with people who keep my data sacred, but help me understand my business better. And my industry has been giving away its data for easy money. We're like kids in a schoolyard, you know, walking up to the pusher. And someone's going to give me candy for my data. They're going to write me a check. They're going to put ads on my site. They're going to call them stories. And I'm going to take it, because it's easy money. Everybody's taking that money, but we have to rethink those arrangements because we're giving the data away. And giving the data away is like taking candy for the family silver, you know? It's our future, and we can't afford to do that anymore. Just recently, you know, with Facebook and its instant articles, they're building a very big walled garden, and they're partially using our content and making us data dependent upon them. You know, one week, Apple says to us, come use our wonderful new Flipboard type thing, and we all line up. We're so grateful to be on it. And then the next week, they say, by the way, iOS 9, which comes out later this year, has a facility for ad blocking. We live on ads. Come use our platform. You don't need a CMS anymore. And, but by the way, all of our customers, because they're our customers and they only do part of what you do, have the ability to turn off ads. <laughs> And the arrangement right now with companies like Facebook, who are, could be good partners, but they'll have to demonstrate that, is you sell the ad and you get 100%. We sell the ad and you get 70%. This sounds like a terrific deal considering they're so much better at monetizing digital than we are. Until they turn that deal off, you're becoming much more dependent and they have data that they will give to you, but how good is that data to you if it's an aggregate? How good is that data to you if you can't parse it, if you can't study it, if you can't use your tools to understand what that is? So forgive me, I am a Canadian, but as legacy media executives, we're skating to where the puck already is. And if you love Wayne Gretzky like I do, you skate to where the puck is going to be. And if you want an even different analogy, maybe it's even a different game right now than than the hockey analogy. I won't know that, you won't know that, and again, addressing my publishing colleagues, you won't know that if you don't know what and who make up your data.
These are game changers I've been thinking about a lot. So you sign up for instant articles. You almost don't need a CMS anymore. Huge amount of your revenue is coming from there. But I would say one of my five key guesses would be that in less than two years, 100% of Facebook's news feed will be video. So what we're calling instant articles, I would say instant video. It's a visual world. It's a visual culture. There are many studies on what's happening to text as a medium. And so this is a new thing that I have to learn how to do if I'm right about this. In less than three years, 90% of digital display will be programmatic. At Digital First Media, my company, about four and a half years ago, we had no digital ad revenue per se, and now we have 200 million. 40% of it today is programmatic. What percent will it be three years, four years from now? Easily, I think, it's in the 90% range. I wrote this slide before I read about iOS 9's development, but I think less than five years, 75% of devices will utilize ad blockers. Already worldwide, 15% of device users use ad blockers. I don't. I don't turn anything on to block because I'm in, I'm in media and I want to see what's out there. But lots of people don't want to see lots of things. So as I think about what's happening to advertising, shrinking is part of the marketing pie, although advertising is growing, if people are going to turn off how I reach them, how do I then develop a new business? And I'm sure of this one. Five years from, less than five years from now, all major ad agencies in the world will be digital only. It won't be worth their while to handle print, and it won't be worth their while to handle over-the-air broadcast. They're going to be handling digitally only, content on demand. And so a major source of revenue, particularly for the kind of global partners like The Guardian and El País, where I sit on the board, and Prisa owns 20% of Le Monde. Those parties that live on national revenue, ad revenue, from major ad agencies are going to have to figure this out, because it's digital that these people are going to want to work in. And this is a wild-ass guess, as we say in America, on my part. But I think in less than 10 years, Google, the world's largest ad company, is going to be a services company in the main. They'll still be doing advertising, but it won't be in the main what they do. Um, advertising companies aren't generally developing driverless cars. Advertising companies aren't generally developing space travel. Advertising companies aren't generally building fill-in-the-blank, the kind of things that they're doing at Google. I think most of those decisions that you see here are based on, if we have the data, what can we do? If you have a machine to generate audience, what do you do with the data on that audience? And we have a machine, and if, if even one of these guesses of mine are correct, I would say legacy, fa legacy media, old media, faces even bigger challenges uh, than we have to date. Different revenue streams, certainly different products, certainly the different costs that go with that product, and again, that crunch that we all face in legacy media of trying to figure out the new and afford the new and who to partner with and who to build with and what to build on our own when you are feeling pressure on the profit margin on your old business, which you're still in. So what should we do? Well, despite uh, dressed like a funeral director here and talking about negative things, I would say stop worrying. You know, tech always disrupts, but every disruption in tech in history has always brought more opportunity, not less opportunity. It might, it might crush or kill something that you do, but if you're smart and you learn with that, your core competencies using tech disruption are always going to create more opportunities for you. You have to understand that our huge audiences, the people that I work with as a director or the company that I run, our customer list is in the hundreds of millions. Hundreds of millions. That's not nothing. It may not be big enough for a Google, but it's not nothing, and there are opportunities Advertising still has a long, 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 long way to run. We still have to be in that business. But data is going to get us into this business, services. And we're just getting started. Just getting started. Ecom being the most obvious play, but I can't even think of all of the opportunities there. But I don't think this 
starts for us unless we plug that data leak. The deals that we've been doing in my industry with third-party providers is essentially a data leak, and I could cross out data over here and get my industry's attention if I said plug the money leak, plug the revenue leak, and everybody would, act, everybody would pay attention. But data doesn't look like money right now to us, but it should look like money to us. Scholl said this at the beginning, this is about making more money. Uh, I was a journalist. I believe in journalism. I believe in its power to change. But I also believe what Catherine Graham said, the, the great publisher of the Washington Post, she said, first we have to do well if we're going to do good. We can't just do good. We have to do well to do good. And to do well, we have to make money. So to emphasize, I would say the opportunities only exist if we become proactive around data. We have to own it. We have to master it. Without it, we are flying blind as companies. And we'll be chasing old revenue streams where the puck is all the way down and not building the future. And only, and only being good at data helps us identify those opportunities. If anything keeps me up at night, it's time. Do we have enough time to get this done? In my company, you know, for me, it's all about how fast can we move. I don't care if we make mistakes. I've made a ton of them in business. I've had companies that I nearly blew up, companies that blew up on me, and things I made that were disastrous mistakes. But we keep moving, we keep moving, we keep growing. And I think that if we don't learn to do this, particularly in my industry, again, speaking to my colleagues in publishing, if we don't have that mindset, we're not moving fast enough. I think these are the first crucial decisions that we have to make. The easy money is over, and we have to get smart now. We're going to have to take back control of our data, dump the middlemen. What they call free costs you your future. I want to work with professional data partners. I want to work with, well, like people I'm on the advisory board with. I want to work with people who understand my issues and bring their expertise to my issues. Those are partners. It's not free, but in the end, it's cheap because I'm building my future. And you know, in Silicon Valley, every, it's generally accepted that the deeper you go in the tech stack, if it's user experience at the top of the stack and it's building Intel chips at the bottom of the stack, the greater the value that you're building. But in publishing, I think I have a different take on that. We have, we have to move faster. We only have so many resources. We have to change our investment priorities. And data is difficult to do, and data is expensive to do. And I need a cost-effective data partner where controlling the data is key. So I think the first thing I've, I've learned now is you can't do this alone. You have to pick a data partner. And I do believe that SaaS offerings are the very best way for us to go in our industry because it's a flexible cost structure, not a fixed cost structure. And the one thing that's going to make my industry work is getting out of those heavy fixed cost structures, big buildings, big presses, etc. I'm getting the five-minute warning here, shall we? So for all of the new challenges, there are even more opportunities. Um, it's a message that we must embrace as publishers. I do believe that data management platforms, they do create order out of that chaos. If you have ever seen a demand side chart and a supply side chart and all the lines that interconnect them, it looks like the human body, all of those veins, all of those lines. And it's impossible to, to, think, to think through what you're going to do with all of that information and all of those players. And the DMP brings a new intelligence layer. Luma Partners created that term. It's a wonderful term, an intelligence layer to understand exactly what customers want, to know what people want, matching content, advertising, and services to customers. And I do think this starts to lead to some of the single best opportunities that we have. Mobile's deterministic match, where I am, what I'm doing, who I am, and that device that we hold in our hands, put in our pockets, put in our purses, plus data management, some probabilistic match, knowing who I was, what I've been doing, and then in that moment being able to match those opportunities together with my audiences, the people that I work with, and the hundreds of millions of customers we have, that easily is the single best opportunity in publishing in the 40 year, 39 years uh, that I've been doing this. 
and it gets me excited that we can do this. So look, I'm an optimist, and still, after almost 40 years uh, in this business. I don't see the end of anything, ever. I only see the beginnings of new things. And I hope as we go through this conference today and tomorrow, that we collectively we learn from our colleagues and we learn from the team at CSENS just how big those opportunities are. So uh, this is the only two words I've learned in Norwegian. Thanks. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to take them. <laughs>